The following is a conversation with Marco Iozzi, a concept artist, illustrator and designer who's been working on countless Hollywood movies, TV series and AAA games in all stages of pre and post production. Marco was kind enough to be my guest on this very first episode of the 3D Environment podcast. Even after 15 years of working in different 3D industries, it is humbling to me to talk to the professionals who each have years or even decades of experience and with talents which were not given to me. Having Marco agree to do this gives me hope and confidence that there is a base, a solid foundation to build this podcast on. There's a lot to talk about. Careers, art, work-life balance, technology, the list goes on and on. I want to express my gratitude for this opportunity. Thank you, Marco. Stay humble, stay curious. This is the 3D Environment Podcast. And now, please enjoy the conversation with Marco Iozzi. Awesome. All right, let's get this very first episode of the 3D Environment Podcast started. Uh, this is a super amazing uh, point in time for me to start a new endeavor. And as a very, very first guest, I have here with me Marco Iozzi. We've met uh, once before in a, let's say, in a similar setting um, at, uh, at a presentation of the ICE conference, uh, I think yes. about two years ago. And um, yeah, so it's a great pleasure to have you here. It is for me as well. So thanks, Matt, for this. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cool. All right. For the, for the people that don't know you, give me a quick introduction about yourself. So kind of who are you? What do you do? In which industry are you, are you working? And how did you get to where you are now? So I started, uh, it's a long story because I'm 47. So <laughs> I started in 1998. I'm a concept artist right now, but uh, you know, I, I work in the entertainment industry and I've been working in the, in the entertainment industry since 1998 as a 3D artist first then as a matte painter, and then I moved into concept art. So yeah, I'm Italian. I can tell you, try to make it quick uh, that uh, I, I, you know, as a teenager, I always uh, loved uh, movies and cinema, and I was very interested in understanding how certain things were made, you know, the behind the scenes. And uh, at that time, uh, I mean, there was no, I didn't have internet, there was no internet probably, or at least I didn't have access to. So I remember that I could just buy some newspaper, uh, the newsstand, or watch, for example, some uh, making ofs of DVDs, you know, there were DVDs and I remember buying, uh, saving money to buy the extended versions of DVDs in which you could see actually the behind the scenes for movies. And uh, because I was very interested in how certain things were made, you know, special effects at that time, obviously my taste for cinema was uh, different, you know what I mean? So I had, uh, I loved the action movies because I was doing a lot of martial arts at the time. And so, but uh, it was very interesting because it was very interesting. And I was very interested in uh, filmmaking no matter what. And um, soon I found out that uh, a tool that was used and it was the beginning of 3D, this great use of 3D for visual effects. And so little by little, I tried to understand more. And I got, I remember I was probably 17, I got a, a copy of a 3D Studio DOS at that time. There was not even 3D Studio Max, and this shows my age, but uh, I had the chance to start playing with it and definitely, I immediately fell in love, absolutely. So uh, this was my beginning, and um, I remember that at that time uh, I was starting and I wanted to, I knew that I wanted to do computer graphics and to know more about computer graphics. And at that time, the only possibility that I have was to go to university in Milan to study design because uh, in universities I could have access to silicon graphics because at that time, Ooh. you know, computer graphics, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I had my uh, copy of 3D Studio DOS, but I, you know, I wanted to do things properly. So I decided to go to university and I spent three years there, but then I realized uh, 
uh, little by little that computer graphics was just a portion of uh, mm. that university and that you know, journey of studying. So I decided after three years and a lot of exams done to give up and to instead try to focus more on computer graphics. And at the time uh, I was living in Italy, I was uh, studying in Milan. There was a little school of visual effects. So I decided to stop university, attend the school, and uh, which was very, very superficial, obviously, because my country is well known for other things than visual effects. <laughs> <laughs> it was a nice experience because um, actually not so much for the education itself that obviously, you know, it was like probably four months. So it was very superficial. But uh, it opened the door for me to the industry, let's say, the industry, uh, quote unquote industry, because it was uh, like advertisement in Milan, in Italy. Mm -hmm. There was not so much, but it was the beginning of uh, understanding uh, a little bit from close up what it meant to work in this industry. And then I soon realized that uh, I didn't want to stay in Italy. I couldn't stay. I stayed for two years. I worked on movies. I mean, very, very, you know, B-like movies, you know, so visual effects, <laughs> like, you know, storms and bees invasions and this kind of things, you know <laughs> what I mean? So not uh, blockbusters, but it was pretty cool. And it was uh, definitely an experience. But then I realized that if I wanted to do this job properly, I had to move away. And this is the beginning then of my journey abroad. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I mean, you you got to start somewhere. Absolutely. Right? When I'm thinking back to, I must have been around 12 or 13 years old. I had a couple of very distinct like points in time where I suddenly started to consciously realize growing up that 3D is something that is incredibly interesting. And for me, oh, yeah. hearing about the movie Terminator 2, that was 1992, and I think just very shortly before there was uh, Jurassic Park, yeah. and which I think I shouldn't even have been able to see back then based on my age. Yes. And then I, I also actually, interestingly enough, I was standing at a, or I was looking at a, at a magazine, it's, it's super cool, German magazine still exists, um, digital production. And back then I remember the cover was some sort Sort of ice bear and everything was 3d and i was completely blown away and uh, i remember back then i with the pocket money i i, I saw the price of the magazine and couldn't afford it yeah. <laughs> did you have a similar like experience where you suddenly realized this could turn into a career based on uh, something that you saw or that made you conscious or aware of this uh, potential career track well, uh, absolutely. Like you said, that there were movies. This, you know, we, we're talking about the 80s. So in terms of a mm -hmm. certain kind of movies, it was uh, amazing. You know what I mean? And I remember that, you know, for example, a lot of people who do my job, they fell in love with Star Wars. Obviously, mm -hmm. everyone, mm -hmm. you know. But for me, uh, definitely Star Wars was uh, mind-blowing. It was uh, incredible. But I remember that... Um, uh, a movie like Blade Runner for me is what made the difference. Not only this, but I remember at the time that I was watching on Sunday, they were giving the movies of Ray Harryhausen, so in stop motion with creatures. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I remember watching these movies and definitely being transported in these worlds. And this is why I, I, you know, it's something that, you know, you fall in love, you know what I mean? And to be honest with you, uh, this is a big luck because uh, you, you end up meeting people people in your life and it, it's difficult to find people who really knew what they wanted to do since they're young and this is uh so it's a big luck it was very important so definitely watching these movies made me fall in love and, and made me understand okay so uh, got me curious to say okay maybe this is something that uh i can do at the beginning obviously i didn't have any news? I mean, I didn't know anything about it. How could I do this? Mm -hmm. But then, you know, finding out 3D and I remember as it is yesterday, the feeling of seeing a, a 3D model in wireframe turning, being able to turn this 3D model, mm -hmm. it was uh, mind blowing. And so for me, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's ridiculous to say now, but I remember this moment and it, it's when I said, okay, this is what I wanted to do. I want to be able to create, you know, all the kids, you know, we're so creative. And the problem is then that often we stop, but actually this was a way for me to keep on playing. And mm. so, mm -hmm. yeah, it was pretty clear to me. That's a very interesting idea. That statement which you just made is that you can keep on playing. Yeah. 
that's quite a profound statement right at the beginning, right? Because this is something like, uh, yeah, it has to do with where do you want to go in career, in life, and um, can also uh, these, the, the things that are discussed in Peter Pan and so on, like we, we yeah. don't want to grow up. So I can, <laughs> I can fully relate to that. Yeah. Um, very cool. Yeah, no, for me it was... I did see Star Wars uh, also back then. Uh, I wasn't super aware of Blade Runner back then, uh, interestingly enough. But for me, there was a, a dis very strong distinction between kind of movies that were super fascinating, like, for example, Star Wars, but then realizing that there's this computer graphics, 3D graphics component to yeah. it, which kind of tied it to the computer. And then also kind of seeing the, the wireframes uh, on in, in making offs and so on. Oh, look at the 100,000 US dollar workstations they can <laughs> touch and use. And it's like this nostalgia completely can relate yeah, yeah. to that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's true. Very cool. Now, I mean, looking at your IMDb page, uh, you have almost 50 credits there. Cool. Didn't even know. Okay. <laughs> it's crazy. It's across everything like game cinematics hollywood movies tv series like you name it uh it's super impressive thank you now reflecting on your career if you're looking back was there one project that had a kind of a significant impact on you on your skills and also on your mindset as an artist um well definitely there are uh a lot of projects that I worked on that I have uh, fond memories of. It's difficult to name uh, one or a few uh, if I have to say <laughs> something, mm -hmm. because often it's not uh, the project itself, but actually it's the, the environment and the people that you do the work with. So if I have to mention something, of course, you know, I had the chance to work on Game of Thrones. And so that was mm -hmm. awesome because the series was very awesome. It was, was very, you know, well known and it was a, a big project. And then working for Marvel on Thor. But if I have to say something, uh, it, sometimes the projects that are the, the biggest on paper uh, from a technical perspective, from a creative perspective, not 100% of the time are the best in that situation, in, mm -hmm. in, in that regard. You know what I mean? It's like uh, sometimes it's really the name that it's good to have on IMDb, it's good to have on your resume, but it doesn't mean that it's the best experience. If I have to say something, uh, I would definitely mention Harry Potter because Harry Potter was the first big project that I worked on when I went to London. And for me, going to London after Italy, when I decided, okay, I have to leave my country and it was a big bet, and it was uh, I had to have a little bit of courage if you want because I had to leave you know my girlfriend my friends and what I knew just to follow a dream and uh, beside working at the mill on some commercials I had the chance to work on Harry Potter so it was for me amazing because it was a big movie mm. I was uh, alone uh, I met incredible people and so I have uh, great memories of uh, the people that I work with, the project itself. And, uh, but, you know, again, I want to underline the people because still to this day, after 25 years or so, I'm still in contact with these people because you start this work and you start to, you, you know what it means to work uh, in, uh, in the trenches, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And you, you work uh, 16 hours a day, then you go out to the pubs and you get drunk and then you go back to work mm -hmm. because you have a delivery and the next day there are dailies. So I remember this project uh, because it was uh, my first uh, big uh, project, you know, and the, the big thing that I worked on that really opened the door then for my for the future after that. So really cool. You just mentioned for this project, you, you actually had to travel away from home, from Italy, and uh, basically start living, living and working abroad. How did this whole process of traveling in, uh, itself, I mean, you continue to travel afterwards, but how did uh, traveling itself influence your career and, and personality? Well, it's something that if I think uh, now in hindsight, uh, I mean, it's something that I was afraid of. Uh, to be honest, at the beginning, when I when I left, I was 24. Uh, I was the I you know, I hope I could stay in Milan and do and do the work and do, uh, you know, and be happy. But actually, I realized that if I stayed there, the quality of my work would have stayed, you know, 
in, in, in a certain mm-hmm. at a certain level, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I was really ambitious and uh, I had the chance to, I was keeping on working on my portfolio because this is always important. And I had uh, the chance to be called by the male who gave me, uh, you know, told me, okay, if you want to come, you come and we can mm-hmm. test, we have an interview and then uh, you start. And for me, this opened the door to, you know, my career, my life, if I have to, because, you know, in life, uh, I think decisions are the most important things, you know, things that can make a difference between Mm. failure or success, you know what I mean? And uh, this was the best decision that I could make. And sometimes even nowadays, I'm contacted by a lot of young people and they ask me, uh, you know, tips on 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 career and uh, i know that things change also because of covid and whatever and uh, working remotely is much more common Mm -hmm. but to be honest nowadays i work remotely and i've been doing it for many years and i'm super happy but to be honest with you the traveling for me has been the the greatest uh, experience because not only it opened the doors for my careers to new opportunities. It allowed me to learn so much working on certain kind of projects. But again, because of the people that I met, the experience, the life experiences. So, mm-hmm. um, okay, maybe nowadays you can become a fantastic concept artist by working from your bedroom. I mean, it's possible, but I would advise anyone to travel, to discover the world, to go to meet people who come from everywhere, because this was also amazing. I was in in Italy used to the same kind of people. I went to London and it was like a very international. There were people coming from everywhere, working mm-hmm. on the same projects. And this opens your mind so much. So it, it's great. You know, I, I left my country such a long time ago and I never regretted it. Never. Yeah. yeah. I can also relate to that. I've been doing this same thing. I, I traveled a lot over the last couple of years just for work in general, for doing trainings internationally. Uh, or consulting projects um, in a lot of different countries. But I also have been working from England. Uh, and then I, I, I uh, worked also from Canada, from Vancouver. Yeah. Uh, also living there, obviously, uh, uh, for a short time also in, in, in Los Angeles um, in 2008. And it is indeed marvelous in kind of also how, how you start to discover yourself in how Absolutely. do you react if you don't know anybody and um, it's humbling then also to see all of the talent that is then suddenly combined within one dark room for example right yeah 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 no, absolutely. It changes your life because also I had the chance to live uh, in, in, in different countries so to understand really you know how they're used to living and to adapt and to I know it was a uh, it was incredible, and um, after an experience like this, then you see, of course, the other people. Maybe when you go home, they don't they, they didn't live what you lived, so you start to become mm-hmm. a little bit different. But I think it's uh, definitely an, an enriching experience. So I advise anyone to do it. Also, because to be honest with you, uh, when you go, when you leave, uh, and you go to, to work, for example, in a place like London, or I had the chance to, uh, to live in New York, for example, you're surrounded by people who want to achieve uh, their goals. You know what I mean? And, and it's and it's true that you, uh, you know, the people that surround you, uh, they, they're very important in defining who you are. And mm-hmm. so I was, uh, uh, you know, I dove into this uh, environment in which there were people who were ambitious, who wanted to learn, and this pushes you to give the best. And this is very important. If you stay always in the same place, and there are people who no matter what, like often happens in Italy, unfortunately, they try to, I don't know, to do what the parents do, to follow a certain kind mm-hmm. of uh, mm-hmm. life that is more uh, quote unquote common, let's say, then you will, 99% you will end up like that. Instead, I was surrounded by very talented people and this always, uh, you know, pushed me to be better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, one aspect also of that that I'm, was quite surprising to me is the aspect of the ambition of some of those people, some of those, uh, I mean, you have them in all walks of life where uh, people are extremely ambitious, but especially in the creative sphere, I have seen incredibly talented people that have an incredible drive. And yeah. um, I mean, I read that many years back in a, in a magazine article or online somewhere that there were people that were so basically 
during the early phases of uh, the, the ramping up of the production of Transformers 1, a uh, movie from Michael Bay, right? Um, so the first visual effects company started to search for artists and there were like incredible Transformers fans out there, 3D artists, and they, they reached out to those companies and said, hey, I want to have this credit. I am willing to work for free to get, oh, wow. to get this position, right? And this can obviously, in the, in the whole dialogue of what is fair, which kind of work conditions or which salaries, it's a huge topic right at the moment. But this dynamic is something that also plays, right? So there are always people that want it more than you. Yeah. To me, that was incredibly humbling. Incredib incredibly humbling that there's, uh, and they're willing to relocate, they're willing to to do everything and they are oh, yeah. super nice people and they are incredibly talented and that's just the, the international market and if you stay in your little boat you're you're never going to realize this right exactly yeah exactly so you had from my research which i did you had three main career paths one was in uh, 3d then digital matte painting and then design in general can you talk to us a little bit more about that and what were the influences to do changes to go from one to the next one? Yeah, well, I think that, first of all, uh, it's it's my nature. I'm a freelancer at heart and I like to, to change and I like to learn new things. I cannot stay in the same place for too long. I cannot work on the same projects for too long. So uh, <laughs> after many years doing 3D, I thought also organically that there were certain things that could be, for example, done in a different way. And uh, I always had the passion and I studied photography. So I was, uh, it was normal for me to think about uh, ways of doing things differently. And for example, combining my different passions, in this case from 3D, moving to my painting, uh, it was the right thing to do because I was interested in creating this beautiful landscape and using my knowledge of 3D by putting together mm -hmm. uh, my passion for painting and the passion for photography. So I, I, I saw this as a, a normal evolution, okay? So obviously mm -hmm. it, didn't, it didn't come very quickly, it, it took time because at, at the beginning, you know, for 12 years, uh, I was, uh, like I was saying before, I traveled a lot and I was working on site. I was working in studios. And when you work in studio, there is also the chance of climbing the ladder if you're ambitious and you want to have a different kind of role. So that could have been one path. And I've been able to, to be a lead, so to have my team of people. But I was more interested, to be honest with you, in my personal pursuit and my personal will to learn new things. So instead of doing that, I prefer, for example, to go to work in another company, which, for example, could give me the chance to start doing a Mac painting. And uh, so this was, uh, I mean, if maybe if I stayed in 3D, you know, you, you can become then a CG supervisor, then, mm -hmm. a, you know, a visual effects supervisor. But that was mm -hmm. something that I was not interested in because then the work changes. You, you stay away from the actual creative work. You have to become more like, a, uh, it, the work becomes more technical. You have to deal with people more. And uh, I was not interested in that. I wanted to dive, for example, into this world of uh, my painting. I started... Uh, hard and little by little in, in in a few years I moved into that direction and then I, I I've been a matte painter for I don't know something like eight years and at the same time the clients were starting to come to me to ask for um, ideas so th at that time even if it was visual effects they didn't have probably the concept for certain specific sequences and so I realized that the clients were asking me to come up also with ideas and so I decided okay so what can I do to improve, to keep on learning, to learning new, to learn new things, and uh, I thought the design. I studied design, but you know, I, it's something that uh, I was not considering at the beginning. But then I, I thought that it could have been something interesting for me, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. something that could have opened the door even for clients, you know, to be able to offer you know more services, let's say. And so, little by little, I moved uh, into concept art. At the beginning, I was doing it both. I was doing uh, matte painting and concept art. And then I decided to say no, which is also something they could talk about because <laughs> it's interesting in career to say one. no. It's important, <laughs> exactly. And then, I, you know, I, I ended up being a concept artist. But 
uh, I think that uh, it's interesting to understand how, for me, it was difficult. It was difficult to move from matte painting to concept art because, uh, and let's say to visual from uh, post-production to pre-production, even if I work often for post-production still nowadays, but it was important because uh, the mentality has to be different. Because the, when you are a matte painter, you're used to working on something that eventually you will see on screen. So the goals most of the time are photorealism. Mm -hmm. You have to pay attention to details. When actually your mindset has to change uh, not completely, but has to change a lot because when you work in design and concept, it's about the ideas. And so it's about giving a lot of ideas and, uh, you know, as quick as possible. And so there was this struggle always between my, my love for details and realism versus the needs and uh, the needs of the ideas and the needs of a quick turnaround, which is something that I'm still struggling nowadays. You know what I mean? It's something that, because for certain clients, they want to see something that is uh, pretty realistic, something as close as possible to the final product, let's mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. But some other clients instead want something quick just to discuss. And so it, it, was, a, it was a big change for me. And that's why uh, I realized uh, uh, to, that I needed to fill some gaps in my education because I studied design. I, I loved 3D. I studied, you know, st I studied 3D. I work in 3D. But what I was missing was the fine art aspect of it. So the tradition, the fundamentals of art. And so when I decided, okay, let's try to move towards concept art, I also enrolled in a fine art school. Uh, I was working during the day, uh, you know, as a matte painter, but at the same time I was studying because I knew that this would have made the difference. And I'm very, very happy that I did that. When, when was this approximately, when you started fine it was, uh, it was, uh, I would say, around 10 years ago when I moved to Paris, when I decided to settle down. And uh, I, I thought I planned because something that I do is to plan the, the, the next six months to one year to three years, you know what I mean? And try to stick to the plans. <laughs> and I remember that I, that I planned this move. And, uh, you know, when you plan something, you have to always think about, OK, so how this is the goal. How do I develop a system? How do I achieve this goal? You know, and one for me was to go back to the fundamentals and go back and work traditionally, which is something that I, when I started my career, I, I definitely missed. I was doing it, but not enough. I was doing it superficially. And uh, instead I realized that it would have made the difference. And actually it made the difference because also it's on paper that you, that you're able to, at least for me, to develop the ideas. Nowadays, there are so many tools and you can do things in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. But for me to be able to sit down and, and sketch something, even if it's not something that I'm going to show to the client, it's a way of using my, my mind, you know what I mean? It's a way to mm -hmm. reason. Mm -hmm. It's a way to clarify, to solve problems, I would say. Yeah. But so from that description, what I'm basically grasping is that you definitely chose like, let's say switching between positions or switching between companies and switching between tasks. And because of that kind of growing the amount of knowledge which you have in the sense of growing on all fronts, growing as an artist, learning more techniques, technologies like sponge-like versus kind of the aspect of security of, let's say, climbing the, the ladder Yes. Tr more traditionally, what you can do in a studio, you also mentioned this, you could become uh, like CG supervisor, uh, yeah. um, VFX supervisor, producer, whatever, uh, right? So specifically choosing the growing your knowledge versus, let's say, just security, right? Or growing deeper roots in the company that you are at the time. Yeah. But interestingly enough, by doing this, by going in, in your direction, you actually... I would assume you had achieved even more than because it propelled you. It was like almost like a, a uh, like a catalyst for your yeah. ca career. That, it's that's a choice. A, it's interesting. A, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a personal choice. There are people who want a certain kind of security, even if okay, in visual effects, uh, it's not working in a bank. You know what I mean? It's no matter what. Even if you work in a studio. Uh, it's not 100% sure because we see how many studios go bankrupt. So mm -hmm. definitely compared to mm -hmm. a freelance life, it's more sure. Then uh, at the end of the day, like in a lot of things in life, you have to be honest with yourself. And I I wanted to learn because I, I really fell in love with the act of learning, which 
it's nice on paper, but it can become also a problem because uh, it's funny because I didn't know, I didn't do so much at school, you know, in the standard school. But uh, then when I, when I found out about art, the entertainment industry, when I start studying, I mean, uh, it, it became my love. So for me, moving to one discipline to the other, of course, I'm not saying I'm not changing completely in, in going from matte painting to effects. I mean, that, that, there, there wouldn't be nothing wrong if you're a, maybe like a generalist. Maybe you could do it. It's just uh, that, I mean, I see them no matter what, even if part uh, different roles, but still in the in visual effects, in the ent entertainment industry, I see them pretty separate. I'm, I, I think I try at least to follow uh, um, like a, a path that is uh, organic. You know what I mean? There is no matter what matte painting has a lot of uh, techniques, for example, in common with concept art. Nowadays, we use more or less the same. Then it you know, the mentality can be different. So for me, it's kind of evolution. But yes, definitely, uh, you know, if you see, you see online uh, people who are the masters of what they do, but they mostly do one thing mm -hmm. and they're specialists. And of course, for certain kind of projects, the clients require this kind of specialization. And sometimes I envy these people and I try to mm -hmm. specialize. Mm -hmm. And I did for certain things, for sure, because I think it's important then maybe we can talk about it if you want. But uh, at the same time, again, I, I had to be honest with myself. So I wanted to, I'm interested in different things. They are still part of uh, art making, of storytelling. You know what I mean? But they are different. For example, I do music as well. You know what I mean? I'm interested like in traditional, it was, a, it was something that I had to study to become a better concept artist, traditional art, but then I fell in love. And so I always dedicate time to that. And uh, could I be better at what I do just doing, uh, I don't know, just doing designs of uh, landscapes, of characters, for sure. But it's not me. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I prefer to be this because, you know, there are people who are specialists and they are so in love. I don't know, they're car designers. They just do that. Mm -hmm. And I would never be able to be that good mm -hmm. because my passion for that thing is not as strong. So I'm, a, you know, it's a, it's a journey for me. It's a constant journey. And uh, I accept it. This is very interesting because uh, at the end of the day, you uh, sometimes, I mean, often, you, you fall trap of the imposter syndrome and you think, okay, I'm, I'm not good. Uh, or I, I, you know, I grow up uh, slowly. I grow in, in my industry so slowly because I do different things. Yes, possibly it's true. It's definitely true, but it, it's me. So I'm just being honest and I'm just uh, enjoying really the, the journey, you know what I mean? And as long as I can keep on paying my bills and having the clients <laughs> and having work, you know what I mean? It's good. It's good because I learn different things and I really love this aspect. Yeah. This is also something that I uh, very often struggling myself with. There's a lot of personal projection in these things. Like uh, I see other people that are, let's say, a little bit younger. They're already further in the career. Yeah. And uh, there's this constant feeling of there's a 10 year gap of where I should be Absolutely. versus where I am. That is, but I think that's part of the human condition and also of kind of the famous struggling artist, right? Absolutely. Um, but th there's another component to that. And that moment of realization or acceptance that you just mentioned before, that you cannot master every craft in life and you have to choose because life is finite. Um, yeah. Do you have a, a distinct moment in time where you had this realization I, I don't think there is a distinct moment in time i think it's a daily realization a daily mm -hmm. acceptance mm -hmm. of uh, of yourself of your limitation of the fact that there will always be people who are better than you mm -hmm. and uh, you should use this to push but probably what is important is uh, i i think growing up which is a big risk today for young people is uh, understanding that at the end of the day is not a fight against other people. Is not you don't have to prove that you're better than other people. It's always a fight against yourself. And so, as long as I'm learning something new, as long as I'm doing something new every day, then I'm at, I'm at peace. Then 99% uh, is a failure, but uh, it's it's really a fight. This probably comes from my years. Uh, studying martial art. And uh, I think it's the best thing that you can learn. 
above all in this industry and above all in concept art where I see a lot of ego. There are a lot of uh, people, sometimes you hear, uh, I mean, interviews and uh, they, they speak like the more important than the director of a movie, for example, which is ridiculous. Wow. And I'm glad that I arrived uh, at a certain, uh, at working in concept art after many, many years of visual effects and also not that young because uh, this plus social media, it could really, you know, it's a rabbit hole. It could really be a trap. So I'm glad that I arrived with a certain kind of maturity in which I don't have to uh, become, you know, you see so many beautiful things. And I accepted the fact that, uh, you know, this is my journey. My journey is different from anyone else. And when I see something amazing, it could be a short film, uh, it could be a concept art, it could be design. I know what it means to do it, you know? So I'm excited by seeing this kind of things and excited for myself. And I say, okay, how, what can I learn? How can I get better towards that direction? What is interesting in this piece, for example, in this short film for me and, uh, but, and I accept the fact that, uh, you know, maybe I will never be able to achieve the kind of level or, but I have my own personal journey, you know what I mean? And I'm satisfied with it. So at the end of the day is always, are you happy with yourself? Because a lot of people, I think that maybe they, they work, uh, you know, it becomes a sickness because this is a passion. So if you end up working uh, 18 hours a day, uh, not having a social life just to achieve a certain goal, because what? Because you want to create, you know, designs of robots and things, then, you know, then this mm -hmm. clashes against uh, normal life and relationship and it, it, mm -hmm. can be, it can be a trap, you know? It's. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I answer to your question, but no, no, you know. it uh, this it makes perfect sense, and I I definitely also, this is something that I'm I'm personally also struggling with in kind of, um, how do you define success? When are you happy with uh, what you have reached in life? And yeah. um, especially if you're working in a field that is creative, the project is never done, right? So you are setting yourself up to failure in general. Yeah. So those aspects are, let's say, very dangerous. And I see these things in, also in myself, right? I'm working hard, I'm working long hours. But in the end, it makes me happy. So I, I love what exactly. I'm doing. But still, this this little tiny demon on, on, on your shoulder is whispering in your ear. So kind of, is it, uh, are you sure you want to do this? And, but... This is part of the journey and this is part Absolutely. of the struggle and growth that eventually you will be able to look back on your life and um, hopefully say that it was worth it, right? But you, you need to be conscious uh, of it or at least try to be and uh, be able to, to tame that piece. Absolutely. And I don't want to give the idea that it's something so easy. So all, very mm -hmm. often, mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, there is something and I still feel that I have something to say. And I am starting, you know, tools and techniques to be able to, it's like, it's like I'm learning a language and I would mm. like to be able to speak. And often I feel that I can't, but uh, I, I keep on showing up. And I think this is the important thing because my love for learning, for trying to, if you want also in, in a way, it's uh, to love yourself is to follow this instinct. You know what I mean? Maybe I will never find that really my, mm -hmm. my voice, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, even after so long. And sometimes you see young, young kids and they do short films and they do incredible mm -hmm. things and you yeah. say, holy mo, that's awesome. But, yeah. uh, and I'm not able, but at the same time, again, like, like I was saying before, it's a different journey. You, you, yeah. you, you, yeah. you never know a different person. So as long as I do, what I like, as long as I wake up every morning with the will to, to wake up because, you know, today there will be another day in which I can learn something new. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I think this is the real success for me. Yeah. yeah because if, if you're willing to stand up or get up in the morning and, and even wake up, obviously, there's a willingness for change to exactly. go in whichever direction you want to go. Yes, absolutely. So... Let's switch topic a little bit to, to the difference between studio work and freelance work. And uh, there's a, a subcomponent of that that I'm, I'm really curious what your opinion on it is. There's this statement that if you have, let's say, for example, bigger companies, you can basically climb the ladder. 
right? Yeah. Uh, in the sense of that's kind of the typical definition of having a career, being able to jump level from level to level to level to to yeah. earn more and more, with more responsibility, obviously better salary and so on and so on. Now, if you extrapolate this to how this would end, is eventually. If you would get to the top, you would be basically, let's say, the CEO or the owner of the company, right? Eventually, after, let's say, a couple of years or so. Now, yes. comparing this to being a freelancer, where by definition, you are your own boss. And so basically, you can step out the studio and say, OK, I'm, I'm going to do this myself. You have immediately kind of jumped that gap and you became the boss of your own company by just basically switching roles and taking the company, the freelance status in your own hands. How do you see the difference and or is the difference only the security of because one is a, let's say, a tiny company and the other one is a big company? Well, I've always been a freelancer, but for a period, for 12 years, I was working on site in different, different companies. But I could see the, the company life from, I was inside, so I was working with the teams and I could understand what it was. And like I was saying before, I've always been a freelancer at heart, so I, I never saw myself uh, really, you know, climbing the ladder. I was not, I never saw the interest in doing this because I, I had the chance to do it. I know what it meant. I realized uh, that uh, the work was changing because mm -hmm. then you have to start also managing people, which could be awesome for uh, because you know it's a lot of satisfaction. But at the same time, you have to deal with other problems and solve other problems more than instead doing the work. And I always love to do the work. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So in terms of a career and a step up for me, it was like uh, becoming a lead on some project, means meaning that I had my team, but I was actually still working on things and being a freelancer uh, allowed me f the, the freedom the freedom to choose the projects that i work on and to decide to change career path so it's something that definitely since the beginning was very close to to my heart but to be able to do this i realized since the beginning that i had to do certain experiences, I have to make certain experiences and learn how to work with other people. Because even if you're a freelance and now you work remotely, you still, I think it's very important to understand what other people do so that your work can, uh, you know, can be useful, you know what I mean? And so for me, it was uh, absolutely the right choice. And again, a way to be honest with yourself. Mm. But you, yeah. you did need that process of going through smaller productions, bigger productions. Absolutely, yes, and, exactly, and yes. Eventually, yeah, yeah, yeah. you found out by basically going through the process and, and let's say, maturing into or in the industry or in the craftsmanship to basically then say, okay, this next step needs me to be a freelancer so I can basically do the type of work that makes you most happy also. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. It's about, uh, yeah, being honest with what you want in that moment, what you need, but also it was a goal for me. So since the beginning, even when I was traveling, working on site, I knew that one day I would have loved to work remotely, which at that time was something that, you know, never happened in mm -hmm. the visual yeah. effects industry, yeah. Yeah. but I was dreaming about it. And I thought, okay, I think this could happen, but to be able to do this, First, I have to learn so much. I have to work with people. I have to work with different studios so that no matter what, my pool of clients is bigger. You know what I mean? People will know who I am. That's why today I work with clients. It's, it's funny because uh, maybe with people that I worked with on site 15 years ago, mm -hmm. but I've been able, I, I did this first. So mm -hmm. again, it's a process of design, <laughs> quote unquote, because you, you, you know there is a goal. How do you achieve that? I cannot say, okay, no, now I want to be a freelancer, work for uh, big studios from home, uh, from my from my couch. It This doesn't happen. It, you have to plan. So that was my plan. Yeah. But one, one thing that is deeply rooted in this strategy is the understanding of that you need to have the, the, the social connections first yes. to make this happen eventually. Um, so... Basically, kind of going in in the direction of, I just want to start freelancing and start working with the big studios. 
won't work if you don't have the personal connection and have spent time in the trenches with those people. Yeah. They, they eventually grow with you in different, uh, let's say, positions in the industry, but you still can share the stories and they, they obviously they will remember you. They will know yeah. um, kind of what your value system is and then say, okay, I trust this guy. I'm, I'm going to do business with him because I see he's yes. now a freelancer or, or she or whoever, right? I know, absolutely. Yeah. This, of course, it's interesting to know that this was... I mean, 20 years ago, and now things changed because of social media. So mm -hmm. I believe that there are certain things that are still, mm -hmm. uh, that they work like this, they're still valuable. But also, uh, you know, at that time I had to travel, I had to work, I have to go and travel to work on site, mm -hmm. face to face with people. Nowadays it's different, you know, and even to know yourself. I remember that I was used to sending show reels on uh, VHS tapes. So <laughs> I was spending money via snail mail, sending my tape, who I'm sure was uh, trashed immediately upon receiving. Mm -hmm. But, you know, things change. Nowadays with social media, you can be online. Everyone can see your work. It's different. But uh, at the end of the day, I, I do believe, though, that uh, the way you are with other people. And so the fact that these people, you work with people and now uh, they come back to you because they know who you are, how you work, uh, always remotely. I mean, it, it's, it's different. Maybe you can have a, yeah, you can get a job because you have a nice pictures on your portfolio, but it's, it's not the same thing. Uh, and it's not that easy, you know what I mean? But it's just to say that things change in the industry. As the technology change, the way to interact, the way to get a job, you know? So I'm talking about my experience and the beginning was uh, many, many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do agree. And of course, things change over time. And uh, let's say the, the uh, just being able to just have have calls online and have meetings online and just put your portfolio online and, and uh, send reels via email. Uh, d those things are a lot easier nowadays, but still in the end to land, let's say the first job, the, these things might be easier, but still you need to be consistent nevertheless, right? Absolutely. Certain aspects of uh, human interaction, they, they are unchanged. And that, that's basically a fundamental game that you have to play as uh, in business, right? You need ah, yeah, to yeah, stay yeah, consistent and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally agree. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So before you were mentioning the traditional fine art and photography and digital art, how do you see them in relation to each other? Now that I work in design and as a concept artist, they're very related because uh, I think that the most important thing is uh, the fundamentals. So your knowledge and your knowledge comes from uh, studying traditional art, in my opinion. And um, so studying drawing and, and studying painting because they develop a way to think about things, the way to compose shots, even if afterwards and nowadays we use so much technology for sure. But if you rely too much on technology, technology that evolves uh, at the speed that we know of, uh, then if something changes, you're stuck. If you have the knowledge and you know the rules, then no matter the technique, no matter the tool, you can still express yourself. And so I, I, I knew at a point in my career, like I said before, that it was the time for me to go back and to strengthen this uh, basis uh, of uh, traditional art and fundamentals and composition and filmmaking and, uh, uh, you know, uh, color theory. It's so, so many things that then you apply on a daily basis, even if, of course, the final product is not, is not a sketch anymore but it's something far more realistic. But still, I mean, the ideas are there. And actually, it's funny how you can see the difference when you look at pieces uh, online. You, you can see easily when someone has this knowledge or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for me, it opened the door also to something that I fell in love with. Another thing I fell in love with is traditional. Mm -hmm. And even probably because growing up and, you know, being so much in contact with this technology that keeps on evolving, I got to a point in which I was a little bit uh, tired of this. Mm -hmm. So every time I have a chance to go back and sit down at my desk and take my, I don't know, charcoals, uh, pencils, whatever, I mean, uh, I'm happy. And 99.9% .9 of the times what comes out, it's a failure. 
but this is the struggle that it's so enriching. And even after 10 years that I've been doing it on a daily basis, uh, the, the process and the growth is still very slow. Probably I am very slow by nature, I don't know, but uh, I don't care, you know what I mean? Because I enjoy, because it gives so much uh, satisfaction when you start uh, to see, for example, lines that are flowing a little bit better. You know what I mean? When yeah. every time you do something and there is a little bit of an improvement, this is fantastic. This is addictive. And at the beginning, it's tough. So you have to have the, I don't know, the, the personality to not give up. When I start a project, it's nice because I go to a cafe here in Paris. I go out to have a coffee and I sketch something. Ideas very, mm -hmm. because it's a way for me to to start, you know, thinking about the project. Then, of course, I go back to the computer and you find references, whatever, okay. But beside this, I always try to have my hour, 30 minutes even, or even less, if there is a problem during the day, to no matter what work traditionally, mm -hmm. and do some figure drawing, something like this, because I love the, the act of doing it. So, yeah. I mean, the what you just described the picture right uh, some of the people in the audience will be so jealous you just mentioned i'm going to the cafe here in paris and i'm <laughs> going to sit it's like i already have like the references from all the movies and ratatouille and and so on in my mind right you, you see the guy sitting at the cafe um like sketching drinking a coffee it, it's yeah like, yeah it's like to a lot of people that's like the perfect moment or the perfect life. Right? No, no, absolutely, absolutely. It's just a way what you have in mind in movies and stuff, the result is always amazing. You know, you go around the artist and you look at what they're doing and it's always something amazing. For mm -hmm. me, it's not the case, but still. <laughs> so you're, still you're the process. bending the sketchbook towards exactly. you. So oh, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, not for sure, but still it's, uh, it's fun. It's fun for sure. Actually, it's quite interesting. Just a few days ago, I saw this post online where different painting softwares were compared to each other regarding how realistic the blending is of the digital colors, let's say oil, I think it was oil or, or watercolor. Um, there are multiple painting softwares, uh, I think there was like, uh, I don't know, different, different tools, right? And there was this debate and that one of those tools is just better with blending colors in the sense of that it actually behaves more, quote unquote, physically accurate. Is this something that you ever encountered as something that is hindering you or let's say more and more because this is a, you yeah. have actually this experience as a tradition or like an education in traditional fine art that the digital software doesn't do what you expect it to do like color mixing for example i think this is interesting because it allows me to expand on what i just said before mm -hmm. because uh, uh my love for traditional is um so deep that uh, to be honest with you i don't particularly like uh digital paintings, even when I see them from great artists. Mm -hmm. And because what I do for my clients uh, often uh, requires photo bashing and mm -hmm. then a lot of 3D and then paint over for sure, but using texture a lot because generally the, the end result is quite realistic. Even mm -hmm. if it's still concept, like I was saying before, it doesn't get into you know the realm of uh, my painting, doesn't have to be photo real, but still. So I have a way of working, a workflow that doesn't involve so much, you know, the mixing of the digital media, the color and stuff mm -hmm. like this, mm -hmm. is I'm organized in a different way and I prefer because uh, the tactile sensation of the traditional is a different word for me. So I keep them, if you want, a little bit separated. So the, the knowledge and the basis of what you do when you mix, let's say, the colors, but no matter what, for example, when you compose a picture on paper remains when you work uh, digitally, even with 3D, even with photos, obviously. But the technique itself for me is uh, something completely different. When I use a Wacom, I'm in a different, let's say, state of mind. I use different tools. I don't mix the colors. I try to use uh, my library of photography because like I was saying before, mm -hmm. I photograph a lot. So I have a huge library. Uh, I use 3D a lot. And so then I blend, obviously the things come together with painting, but I, I wouldn't consider myself a, a digital painter who starts from scratch just with Photoshop. And personally, it's not something that even when I see the masters doing this, 
I, I don't particularly like it. I have to be honest with you. So when I see, uh, you know, portfolios of other artists who do mm. what I do, concept mm. art, when I see that there is a section of uh, traditional work mm. and it's just on paper, sketches, mm -hmm. this is something that uh, make me say, wow. When mm. I see only digital paintings, it's not, this is very personal mm. because at the end of the day, it's a tool. You know mm. what I mean? It's not something that attracts me so much. Digital painting, yeah. I would agree. There's definitely a difference between if you know the physicality of, let's say, paper or a rough paper oh, yeah. with coal, right? Some of the strokes that you're painting, you can't change. You can maybe exactly. try to erase a little bit more, but the let's say the pure magnitude of, of the talent and uh, the, let's say, the experience, the hundreds of hours of, of drawing. Yeah, absolutely. You can see this so much clearer in one of those physical drawings or physical sketches or paintings versus if it is digital because you can all, uh, there's no undo button on, on, on a f with a physical pencil and, and paper, right? Very good, absolutely. And I want to, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting you say this because um, it's uh, important for me to say, because I always mm. think about this, mm. that there is nothing more personal than a brush stroke. Mm. It's something that you cannot replicate. And yeah. often what we see, even in my industry, what I do uh, at the end of the day, because of client needs and what they expect and how for the tools, you know what I mean? It looks more or less the same, you know what I mean? When actually on paper, it's really you. And I love this, even if my real me still sucks, it's me, you know what I mean? Mm. It's just, I, I can do something that I will, be, will never be able to replicate. There's no undo, like you were saying before. And I love this, I love this. Mm. I think it's very personal, you know what I mean? And nowadays, you know, you work, yes, it's artistic work, but no matter what, it's a business. So you have to do things fast, you know what I mean? So obviously you have to use tools to make it look, to make it, you know, to deliver faster. But uh, at the end of the day, we lose a little bit of uh, personality, I think. Yeah, but um, I mean, they use the right tools for the right task, right? Absolutely, That's absolutely. That's definitely a choice um, for certain things. Like I, I also definitely for certain things, I do prefer pen and paper over doing something digitally because I'm much more faster with brainstorming, for example, right? Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. No, 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 you're absolutely right. Uh, the tool, uh, and I, by the way, I, I love the tools that I use in my mm. daily work for clients. Absolutely, I'm just saying, that this is something different that I fell in love with it, that I probably because, you know, we are oversaturated with this, the amount of uh, concept art and the fact that more or less they look the same. So there's nothing so original. And I'm also guilty of that because mm -hmm. I follow the trend because this mm -hmm. is what the work is. And I love it, don't get me wrong. But, you know, more and more I prefer the traditional for me and when I see concept artists who have this kind of, who come from this kind of, uh, uh, you know, education and they can show this. I appreciate it. If I were hiring someone, mm -hmm. this is something that would make the difference for me. If I saw that someone spent hours and hours and years and years mm -hmm. on paper, mm -hmm. failing, failing, because I mean, mm -hmm. it shows personality, you know, more than, because a lot of the tools that we use are shortcuts. You know, the fact I started doing 3D, there was no final gathering. There was no global illumination. <laughs> we had to put point lights, you yeah. know, here and yeah. there to replicate nature. It was already a shortcut, but yeah. you know, now more and more we have shortcuts. Yeah. Yeah. Let's mention AI, <laughs> oh, <laughs> but this is yeah. another subject, but yeah, maybe we'll talk about this. <laughs> uh, it's a uh, hot topic. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Um, so I, I do remember when I was, uh, when I was working one of those very, very late nights, um, when I was studying architecture many, many years ago, I was doing a, some, I had to do some renderings of, of my project back then. And then I switched to sketching something in my sketchbook uh, because I was brainstorming in which direction I could continue. Uh, and then I laid the pen down and I pressed, literally pressed control Z on the laptop, looked at my physical sketchbook and didn't change. <laughs> Tried again. Oh God, <laughs> come on. <laughs> it's like, Do you see? it's crazy, it's right? It's like a deformation <laughs> professionnelle, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, 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 one of the most, uh, let's say, impressive experiences of where a manual paint stroke matters that I ever saw is there's the, you certainly have heard of the car brand Rolls Royce. Of course. Now this company has one guy 
that literally just is there in this company I think only, but he's he's basically famous for doing a one single line of a stripe on the side of the car, <sighs> hand drawn, <laughs> one continuous line on one side and one continuous line on the other side. Oh wow, I didn't know. Physically, one line, one line. Uh, there are some vi uh, uh, videos of that on, on YouTube. And okay, cool. the guy is basically flown around on the entire planet to go draw just those lines. Oh, wow. I, mean, I didn't know. That's, that's very interesting. impressive, right? Oh, that's yeah. absolutely impressive. <laughs> absolutely. It's true. It's true. But you see how... You see, it's a, it's, a, it's a skill and it requires years and years and years yeah. and years. You yeah. see, this is an extreme, obviously, yeah. but uh, it's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about music and uh, your passion for music, which I, I found, by the way, super fascinating that you're, you're composing your own music for your own show reels. Yeah, I tried. Yeah. Do you listen to music during your work? I, uh, music has always been extremely important for me since mm -hmm. I was a... Uh, teenager then of course you have to make a uh, you have to make a decision you know in life because uh, these again are like a completely different no no not completely different but they're words that you know require a, a lifetime just to scratch the surface i would say it has always been with me i started playing piano when i was a uh, young self-taught Mm -hmm. uh, but played a lot because of, again, probably my the side of my personality, a little bit of a obsessive, but <laughs> uh, absolutely love instrumental music, even when everyone else uh, was loving, you know, metal. I uh, used to, I, I start loving uh, music, uh, I mean, film, film scores, music mm -hmm. for film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, this kept on going. Then for a while when like i was saying before when i came to paris and i decided that i had to go back to school to study fine art i decided that uh, music was not something that i could dedicate so much time and so uh, i decided to stop uh, of course with the travel you know i had my piano at home but then i was traveling so i couldn't practice so much but then uh, even when i was uh, when i decided to do concert art i stopped for a while and then i thought to myself uh, okay after i don't know maybe i i did for two years i stopped doing music listening is something different we will talk about this but actually practicing i stopped but then i said to myself okay no i need to go back to a hobby to something that i love that i can do even if i have 10 minutes or 30 minutes mm -hmm. and even and it's something that even if i fail at the end of the day i won't feel so guilty about because you know the career was important i had to get better at, at concept art and so every time i was trying to learn and it, there was the pressure of what you have to do because you're doing something you love for sure mm -hmm. but it's also your, your career you know it's something that you're you know, you go in a direction that you're taking it has some responsibility. So I wanted to go back to something that I could do for the true for, for the true love of it. And uh, so I I, I start doing it, uh, uh, practicing again. But at the same time, I've always been uh, interested not only in piano, piano playing. I love piano, but also like I was saying, I know I love film music. So I every interview of uh, film composers, every you know everything that I could. Uh, books or stuff like this, interviews and uh, tutorials even, uh, something that I could put my hands on, I was studying because this is part of my personality. It's about learning. Mm -hmm. So electronic music, you know, ambient music, it's something and how to produce this kind of things has always been a hobby. But the way I, I deal with my hobbies, I did them, I do them uh, pretty seriously, even if mm -hmm. I didn't have so much time. And then uh, again, I remember that probably it was because of YouTube, uh, they started putting copyrights on, on Vimeo uh, mm -hmm. when I was doing my show reels. So I said, okay, why don't we combine the two things? Because no matter what the show reels are, 99% of the clients, they don't even listen to the music. They just turn it off mm -hmm. when they, then they watch a show reel. So I decided to, okay, why not? Uh, combining this passion of mine with something useful so that I can produce my own music. And this uh, started the trend and I, I, I'm, I write uh, music. I, I love playing with uh, synthesizers, you know, with the electronic part of it. At the same time, I love to play with my uh, traditional piano, you know what I mean? So it's absolutely, it's fundamental for me because no matter what, it's a way to tell stories. I would have loved, maybe in a different life, I would dedicate a life to, to <laughs> learning 
how to, I mean, to become a professional. But for now, it's uh, absolutely important, even if I cannot dedicate so much time. And I listen to music a lot, even when I work. Yeah. It's fascinating because the statement you made before is that you were kind of specifically choosing music that is also a passion, but allows you this freedom of being able to fail and yeah. not feeling that that pressure that you have otherwise in, uh, even though that it's also creative and it could have been a second career. So I, I would assume that if you would have chosen music as a career earlier on, then it would have been everything, let's say, visual or drawing or kind of rendering or painting. That would have been the, the other side yeah, where yeah, yeah, you, sure. that would allow you to fail. How conscious was this of the, kind of precisely the statement of that it is something that you can do in your spare time, but it allows you to fail as with consciously not having to feel this pressure. It's very, yeah, like I was saying, it's, um, uh, first of all, I want to say that, yeah, like I, like I mentioned, for me, no matter what, is, it's another tool for storytelling. And when my passion for cinema started, it was uh, often, it was not only the images, it was the moving image, but with music. And that's why, for example, in my career, I work often on commercials because not in Italy, because there's a kind of uh, the advertisement industry needs to show you on TV the product that you're selling for mm -hmm. 29 seconds out of 30. When actually, when I moved to London, not all the, not all the commercials, but uh, it was mostly about the, often about the idea. So you didn't have mm -hmm. to show mm -hmm. the product. And often it was smart and it was uh, without, uh, often without words. So there was the image, the power of the image and the power of music. Mm -hmm. And I always loved that. Mm -hmm. So then probably my, my love for visuals was stronger. And so I took that direction, but it's always been very important for me. Mm -hmm. But then, I mean, we have 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. even if it's a big passion and uh, I would love to spend more time, you have to make a choice. And, uh, but no matter what, you see, uh, nowadays, I mean, I don't have to work every single day for clients. Mm -hmm. Plus I wake up very early. I have a, you know, I wake up at five in the morning. And so generally when I work on one single project at the beginning of the afternoon, I'm done. Mm -hmm. So the, because I, I want to have time to do my things, to learn, yeah. to do my personal project, let's say, personal failures, it's better to say. But uh, so I, <laughs> I want to dedicate time to this because it's... Um, no matter what the credit, uh, sorry, creative uh, endeavor. And uh, because, uh, yeah, because um, it's, it's always a little bit frustrating because I start playing, I have so much fun and then I don't have, I mean, the day is over, I have to do something else. But it's good to, to no matter what, be able to do it, to express myself even in this. And, um, and then uh, no matter what, you know, do something and then if it doesn't if it doesn't work it's not a big deal because it's true that with the career that we have uh, i realize uh, that often your mind change i mean your mind changes and and you you do something for example even when you try to do personal work there is visuals you tend to think okay i'm going to do this because then i'm going to publish it mm -hmm. then i'm going to show it to the world which is probably part of the artistic uh, process if you want mm -hmm. you know what i mean because the audience is important for us but at the same time it's also the risk of you know the, the society in which we live the images the social media and stuff like this so i i realize that i think so sometimes then i i, I try to reason and I say, no, okay, I'm gonna do this and I do it for myself. But it's true that it's, in this industry, it's difficult then to do really things for yourself and that's it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So music for me is also this, I do it. To be honest with you, I have the plan in the future of creating music like an album and maybe put it online. You see, probably yeah. I'm sick or probably no matter what, it's part of what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But right now it's, right now it's just for fun. And I love, and I love again, the technology, that allows us to do visuals, mm. but I also the technology for music because no matter in general, the technology that helps uh, men create is something very fascinating for mm. me. Mm. So it's, uh, it's awesome. Like in visuals, I go from a pencil 
to 3D, to the most advanced techniques. Eh? In music, I play the piano, but at the same time, then I go to, on the computer and I use synthesizer and all this incredible tools. So I really love these two things. So the analog, let's say, and the digital and mm -hmm. what the, mm -hmm. the technology allows us to do in terms of creativity. Have you been asked to compose some music for somebody before? Let's say no. for a commercial or so? No, because no? Uh, people, they don't know, beside uh, the music that I put my making of and Shoreel, they don't know that I do music and, uh, and it's better this way. Believe me. <laughs> then I, maybe I, in the I future would, we'll change. <laughs> I would say everybody that listening, is listening to the podcast, now you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, but I mean, uh, no, maybe, maybe in the future I will do something. And uh, it's just, you know what? It's also interesting that sometimes to... To push yourself, you have to give yourself a deadline. So mm -hmm. if I convince myself, okay, I'm going to do, I have to do an album and mm -hmm. I give myself a goal and this is, then depends on the personality and I am very driven. So if I give myself a goal, I will do it. And, and it could be good because this will push me to do something and to finish it. Because often the problem is yeah. finishing something. Yeah. And, yeah. and by the way, this, I could tell you that I'm very self-confident as a man, but I'm very not self-confident in art. And uh, it's funny because the more I grow, the more I feel this. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's very important in my journey, the fact that I, be, probably because of my, uh, the fact that I'm not sure about what I, what I do by my, my output, um, often I'm, you know, I'm asked to do tutorials, Uh, mm -hmm. to to teach but i i don't i don't think i am uh, that good and in a way it's good that i feel this way because i always have a you know this pushes me always to learn more but at the same time i realize that for example this is something bad because i um try to substitute this uh, lack of confidence with learning and even learning if you don't learn well you can spend your lifetime just yeah. learning and doing nothing yeah. and i know that i've been victim of this for a while and if you consider nowadays with everything we have access to the youtube tutorials there's mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. and so for me even in music probably because i don't want to show myself that i suck I say, okay, no, I will postpone this. I have to study as much as possible to be able to be good. And this is a trap because you will never do anything like this. Yeah, yeah I completely see this. And there's also an, another trap that I, at least I'm, let's say I'm conscious of, that I, I also feel victim to myself, is that eventually, especially if there's a, like a complete abundance of quote-unquote training materials, whether it is books or YouTube videos, whatever it is, like consuming too much of that stuff, consuming the theory will actually prevent you from actually doing something. Absolutely. So in, instead of reading 100 books on something, maybe it's better to just read 10 books And then do something during the time that you would actually that it would take you to read the other 90 books. And Absolutely. That, that's something that is for me, that, this is also a realization um, that I didn't have too long ago, actually. Okay. For me, this is a uh, honestly my I know that I'm aware that is my Achilles heel, mm -hmm. is my weak point. Is uh, I know that I wasted some time. Then I tried to refocus because mm -hmm. it's always a matter of you know finding the balance in movement, you know, refocus. Mm -hmm. And but I know that I've been a victim of this. Even in traditional art, I always go back to the school to keep on studying because mm -hmm. uh, when actually instead I see people, some people, and I don't know short films or whatever they do, they try. They don't care yeah. about even if you know they learn by doing. And uh, I'm not that. So I, for me, it's a constant battle to find the balance between uh, I do things and I study. I do things and I study, you know, so, yeah. In this, let's say, conflict or in this field we just discussed, continuing out of that, uh, how do you market yourself and what's your stand on social media? So, I mean, uh, things have, like we were saying before, they changed a lot. And uh, I, I, I realize the power of social media. I am on social media, but I am not a good 
I don't, I don't make a good use of it, meaning that, uh, thank God my work doesn't come from there. But I understand the importance of being visible, above all when you're a freelancer, above all when you work remotely. So no matter what, when I have something new, I post, but I don't want to fall into the trap of, you know, becoming, because it's a job in itself to be good at social media. And I see a lot of people, they're very, they're very good, but they spend so much time trying to interact with other people to post, mm -hmm. uh, even a work in progress, stuff like this, mm -hmm. and to answer which is the right way probably to do it, but I'm not interested in it at all. I prefer mm. to spend time doing something else. But at the same time, I know it's a tool to be visible and it's a tool to be visible above all for uh, young people. You know, they have to show their work and this is a good way of doing it, but it's very dangerous because yeah, on social media, you see 100% success. You see obviously just a portion of what, what is real. If any, because maybe, uh, it, you know, you never know what's behind and it can give to, to someone who doesn't have the experience only starting out, it can give you the, the wrong impression that things are easy to do, that there is no work behind mm -hmm. and there is no failure behind. So it, I'm, to be honest with you, I'm glad that uh, social media became very important when I was already grown up, when I my career was already in a mm -hmm. certain direction and stable, let's say, if I can say stable, because uh, I, I think it can be very dangerous. I'm, and I'm just, I'm not talking about, other, I'm just talking about the, the you know, the art, entertainment mm -hmm. industry, mm -hmm. because then there are other, you know, subjects for which, of mm -hmm. course, is very dangerous. But no matter what, in terms of developing your self-confidence, it's, uh, even for artists, it's difficult, you see, and you always, you can have the idea, everyone else is much better than me. When actually yeah. it's not the case, or it is the case because they worked their uh, ass, I don't know if I can say off, uh, for years and years before uh, showing certain things, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, yeah, I post, I'm visible, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not good, so I don't care about algorithms, uh, you know what I mean? Because, for example, on Instagram, I post, uh, you know, my photography work, my 3D work, the concept, and it's the wrong thing. The, the, the worst thing you can do because generally everything should be separated. You know, the look of mm. the, mm. of your feed should be, in a, I don't care about this kind of thing. Mm. So mm. I have a, I don't know, I don't know how many followers I have very, very few, but I also know people who are so talented, extremely creative people and they don't have social media. They don't need social media. You know what I mean? So it's not, again, and not the numbers of followers mean that you're good or not. You know what I mean? That is absolutely true. And I, interestingly enough, like literally yesterday evening, I had a, I had a meeting um, where we also discussed exactly this. So that especially on social media or like in the context of marketing in general, the algorithm is expecting you a certain quantity of yeah. content so that if you're falling under a certain threshold you're not even considered by the algorithm so you by being on social media you cannot just post some images but you need to be let's say quite aware of what's going on with the algorithm to be able to leverage it yeah. to your advantage um, and this is a lot of hustle this is a Absolutely. Well, yeah, yeah. For me, it's a kind of a journal. So yeah. on Instagram, for example, I put my work and then yeah. there are people who contact me and I always, uh, it's nice because I, no matter what, I give my email, if they have questions and stuff, mm -hmm. this is, this is good. But then, you know, that, that's it for me. Then LinkedIn, uh, I, I publish that. I think it's a little bit more professional for certain kind of work. But again, I don't have my, you know, my clients don't come to me mm. because of what I post sometimes on our station. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I thank God I don't need it so much because I'm not good at it. To be honest yeah, with you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that would be yet another career tangent, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's work. It's a hard work. I prefer to do something else. Plus, I have a family, so I mean, uh, yeah. uh, I dedicate already a lot of time to creative things. Yeah. But I think uh, that there are uh, even more important things. You know yeah. what I mean? Uh, I don't live alone uh, in, a, in a like in a garage, and so mm -hmm. everything should be balanced. And already, it's, there's always. A daily risk of doing on putting too much into your passion, mm -hmm. into art, and so there's a danger. You know? Absolutely. Oh yeah, big danger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
on the societal aspect of those things, what would you say is the impact, the upcoming impact on AI, on work, let's say, in, in your field and uh, society in general? It's a big one. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that, I think that like a lot of people, I mean, uh, I had the mood swings towards it. I mean, I had different opinions. It changed because also the speed of uh, its growth. Yeah. I mean, I, we, we can see that. I mean, so I can say something uh, today, but then in four months, uh, we don't know. I can tell you that at the beginning, well, I'm talking about, because, I mean, we have been using AI for, for a long time, even maybe without realizing, meaning that uh, not only... Okay, for visual, for example, in Photoshop, when you have to erase something, when you have to, there are a lot of tools already that mm -hmm. are driven uh, by AI, which is something uh, good. To be honest, I can say that I'm uh, okay with it when it's something that makes sense. But but let me let me say something. So at the beginning, I saw uh, the result. I played with Mid Journey, and I was uh, I mean immediately depressed because mm -hmm. in a way I felt. Oh God, this is not fair because I put so much effort, so many years in working. And now you write something and then look at the result. So it was a little bit of hate. Then there was a period of denial. Mm -hmm. Then I realized that the best thing to do for me, no matter what, would be to understand it better. So I took a few months And when I had time, I was, uh, first of all, uh, you know, uh, testing the different tools. I'm talking about text to image. So I'm talking mm -hmm. about AI mm -hmm. in my field, okay? Because mm -hmm. like I was saying before, AI is everywhere. So about this, uh, I started to test different software. I realized that a lot of softwares are, I don't know, mostly toys, let's say, things that you can use on social media to change face and stuff like this, okay? But uh, instead, for example, a tool like Stable Diffusion was uh, pretty powerful because of the possibility to train your own model. Mm -hmm. Before saying this, let's say, let's talk about the, the most important thing, which is these models that steal the work of artists without uh, asking permission. So the copyright issue mm -hmm. is a big one. It's something that I hope will change. Of course, if you wait for the US and the Congress to change uh, the, the I mean, rules and stuff like this, I don't know. I, what I'm saying is that no matter what, I think that AI is a tool that will stay. So we cannot pretend that it won't be here, that it is not here. You know what yeah. I mean? So we have to adapt in a way. But of course, when something is against the law, it should be fixed. So this obviously is my uh, opinion. Then I saw like... Uh, a boom of uh, YouTubers who I met, air quotes, met because uh, I wanted to learn. When I started to dive into this, I went on YouTube and I saw these people calling themselves also AI artists, which is something that for me was uh, the saddest thing possible because when I started playing with it, at the beginning I said, I saw the result, amazing quality. But you write something, you write a text, you write a prompt, and you have a result. So after a while, if you come from, a, if you have a certain kind of past, you say, oh, okay, and then what? Because these tools, they take away everything that in my opinion, and not only my opinion, is important in art, which is your personality, which is your journey, which is the struggle. There is nothing there, okay? so. Let's say that I'm totally okay for tools that will make my client work quicker. And so if I have a tool that allows me to extend the canvas, erase a certain elements, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to use it. Inside of Photoshop, for sure, this is what makes sense. But if I have to use a tool that takes away all my work and my ideas, I mean, wh why should I use it? And probably the luck that I had is that in, in this period, I've been working with clients who they don't care about what I do, but they actually come to me because of what they saw that I did. They sometimes they come with to me with some images from AI, but they say, "Okay, this is this is BS." So do something with your eye, with your you know sense of uh, design, with your ideas. So I, I I can say that I work with smart clients, and maybe not one, not everyone. I'm sorry, is so lucky because there are certain industry for sure mm -hmm. that will definitely fire people because they can do things so quickly. 
Uh, oh, you know what I mean? It's happening in a lot of Absolutely. industries. But for me, yeah. yeah, for me, to be honest, is uh, for my personal work, I don't find this uh, pleasure because yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so for me, it's also laughable when I see AI artists because that's not art. Uh, at the same time, I think that, for example, at the beginning of the project, making some tests to see these random results could be interesting, mm -hmm. but I don't want to spend time understanding the language to write the right prompt to have the right result. Because it, it for me, it's not fun. And because, to be honest with you, the way we're used to working for clients in concept art and 3D, but, well, 3D is something a little bit different now, but maybe not in the future. But uh, right now, I mean, I, I find it that uh, it's not uh, reliable. It's very, ran it's still very random. Mm -hmm. I train my own models. So because I have libraries of photographs, so trying to, mm -hmm. uh, to train on my work mm -hmm. to see the results. But then when I start a project, I, I have to be honest with you. I mean, I try to see if I can create something that could help me. Uh, but uh, often clients come back to me and they ask for a lot of iterations, changes. Yeah. And so I don't find this tool, at least for now, I, I can say this, particularly uh, useful unless it's just to have some random results that you can have a look and say, oh, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. But then again, I prefer to go back to my stupid sketches. I prefer to go back to my libraries of photos that I took, put them together in Photoshop the way that no matter what, they, they are shortcuts. But this, this is really, it's not even a shortcut. This is really, I don't know, it's, it's uh, it, taking the soul away mm -hmm. from a, mm -hmm. a process. Mm -hmm. And I and I like that. Even if the result, my result will never be as good as Midjourney, I don't care as long as I can express my idea and my client sees it and I say, okay, this is the direction that we could go. Well, then it, then it's good. And I hope this will not change. Yeah, You know what I mean? I mean, one, there's a couple of thoughts on that is I, I would say the, the technology will obviously influence the market and kind of the, the, the also the demand for different new types of arts. Um, sure. If there's a fast paced, let's say, quote unquote, AI generated, whether it's music or art or any type of those things or like writing fantasy books or any any type of text based books, there will be a market for it because it, it might be the cheaper content, right? Yeah, um, you're right. But uh, the same right. thing with if you can, you can get it uh, a cheaper car, you go, but eventually you could also get get a more, uh, let's say handcrafted car or ha handcrafted yeah, uh, yeah. piece of furniture or piece of art that is that you know, is is actually manually made. So I, I do think and None of them are technically right or wrong, right? Whatever floats no, in your right. boat. I think you're right. And no, um, no, no, absolutely. I think I think you said something uh, important, uh, which I think uh, it, this is technology. Technology. I'm sorry that it's here to stay, and it's true that mm -hmm. the the level, no matter what, it, if the market requests it, there will be this kind of output. There will be low quality, let's say, but uh, mm -hmm. it's true. I also believe in a way I'm not worried because I believe that the hand, hand work, the work done by humans yeah. will be more and more important. You know what I yeah. mean? And I already yeah. see, to be honest with you, a kind of, uh, I mean, there are a lot of people and I think even clients that are not that much into this. Probably, I don't know, like I was saying before, I work with the smart people, but uh, mm -hmm. there definitely will be people who want to take shortcuts and, and not pay. But uh, I don't know. I think that um, I'm, I'm less worried yeah. than I was at times before. Yeah. Maybe in four months, it would be different. And I a risk of losing my job. I don't know. For now, uh, of course, you have to adapt. This is what I'm saying. That's why I, after the first period of denial, yeah. I wanted to dive and try to understand. So now I have it and I know that I have it. Uh, I know it as a weapon, let's say. Mm -hmm. So I understand mm -hmm. what now it can do to me if there's a way to use it without taking away my way of expressing myself my ideas then probably i would use it you know what i mean if it would make me faster but uh, for the moment uh, i think that uh, i'm not that worried and but it's good also that i uh, i started it so i i suggest people not to be just afraid because it yeah. definitely is yeah. a technology that is here to stay and it could do a lot of good not only in art i mean not only 
in other in other uh, you know fields for sure. Yeah, no, ab- absolutely. And um, you mentioned AI artists before. There might be f- uh, for certain people. There might also be certain different interpretations of the terminology of what what is an AI artist or kind of what is um, kind of the, the famous prompt engineering. The first time I was seeing this as a job description that somebody is a prompt engineer, I was like, what the hell? Like, mm. <laughs> come yeah. on, right? But then upon further kind of investigation of the whole technology and the, the emerging even job fields, kind of this aspect of engineering the right types of prompts, meaning in the sense, how do I get the best result using the correct wording structure to understand what the algorithm that nobody knows what it's actually doing, to kind of engineer the phrasing to get the best possible result out. And I mean, there are uncountable many uh, YouTube videos already on, on this aspect of engineering. And the interesting part is actually this in itself, you could almost say, is an art form. So you could say this engineering aspect could be like, quote unquote, AI art, even though that it's the creative problem solving to get a good or better result out of the system. Well, first, yeah, I mean, then it's a it's a matter of a point of views, I think. E- exactly. Uh, you have a different... Yeah. No, no, for sure. It's just that, first of all, even, I mean, to be able to engineer the prompt, if no matter what the model is uh, built on uh, material that uh, belongs to other artists yeah. Yeah. who are not even aware yeah. this is thievery, yeah. no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. Then, uh, then it depends, uh, of course, on the personal preference. For me, saying AI art, then we are talking about words and, you know, it's never yeah. Yeah. good, but uh, art is something different for me. That's yeah. it. S- simply that. And I see yeah. these people, nothing against them. So I maybe I express myself in a bad way. Uh, absolutely. I have respect for everyone. But uh, you see, if you tell me you write a screenplay, you're a director and you want to be inspired by what you're writing and you have a way to immediately visualize, even if uh, uh, in a rough way, even if now, I mean, the quality is pretty high. Uh, mm-hmm. I understand this, but for someone who's used to creating things and knows what it means to create things, even yeah. digitally, yeah, because no matter what, it's hard work. Yeah. So for someone who's used to doing this, um, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, these people who they, they write something and they see the result. And by the way, then they see the result and then they create a graphic novel of it or they print it on a t-shirt and they sell it. Yeah. I don't know. Yes, I think okay, probably they're smarter than me, but actually I, I don't I don't particularly <laughs> like it. I don't I don't see you know what I mean? Um, yeah, no, no, absolutely. It has nothing but, to do with art for me. It's just my personal opinion, though. Yeah, but I mean, this has exactly to do with the appreciation of the craftsmanship. And exactly, yeah. um, to go through the struggle or the learning process of being a novice and then being taught to a certain level. And at the end, let's say, in, like the education or in, in a in an apprenticeship, at the end, you basically get a certificate. And if you wouldn't have to work for the certificate, you wouldn't appreciate it. You wouldn't value it because you didn't put in a a sacrifice. And that's, I I guess, and you, especially you, having worked so long and so hard in that industry, and then it's basically kind of reducing it to write a sentence, wait a minute, or wait even 10 seconds, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's there's even advertisements being made like hey, we are going to produce ten or fifteen images per minute and wait the next version will actually be thirty images as per minute and and we're going to increase this more and more and more so yeah yeah I understand that we are a society <laughs> in which every everything yeah. needs to go fast yeah. and uh, you have to have a result immediately but yeah. Yeah. we're talking about art and I think we should yeah. try to rediscover in general I think we should try to rediscover a little bit the value of time yeah. and the fact that certain things require time yeah. and time is a big uh, it's the real currency the real richness and what we we have and so to be honest if you think about you know i'm I'm not comparing of course we do something that is artistic but it's a business driven but if you think about the the great masters it it, it, maybe it was taking i don't know two years even to do a painting so okay this is an extreme but i'm saying it's a kind of a provocation meaning that no matter what nowadays you have to have everything okay and and it's business, so clients, of course, they reduce time, yeah. but 
there has to be a certain kind of a balance, you know what I mean? And so time, I think we should rediscover time. This is my statement. I absolutely agree with that because time is a, I would say it's a sacrifice because you are sacrificing your personal lifetime of doing something and in that there's the process and in exactly. that in that there's it's like you're you're taking kind of you're converting your lifetime into meaning or into an expression of something absolutely and um and if the the great masters right a, a lot of people for example have no idea how long that it takes for an oil painting to dry Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I, it's true. when I was researching this um, very early in the pandemic, I was just like looking into what, what would it mean to start like classical oil painting. And uh, I couldn't get anything because everything was sold out. But I, I looked into the things and holy crap, some of those paintings take literally two years to dry. Yeah. And yeah. then you just have one layer of paint. And and then sure. you are doing two or three layers, like wow, right? There's there's a sacrifice in 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 following yeah. this uh, as a career or as a piece of art. Absolutely, awesome. So, if you would direct a movie, what would it be? I can <laughs> reply by saying that I absolutely love and respect directors above all directors who write and direct. Mm -hmm. But I knew since the beginning that I would have never been a director because to be a director, you have to be so in love with an idea mm -hmm. that you you can spend, you know, years yeah. trying to tell that story. And this is not me. Mm -hmm. So it's something that uh, would never be a plus. I think that being a director has to do a lot, not so much with the creative side, mm -hmm. but with politics, mm -hmm. trying to get the money. It's very complex to have a movie made, you know, probably, I don't know, 1%, not even 1% of movies, of uh, scripts are green lit. And even less than that, probably they see the, the I mean, they go, you see them on theaters or on TV. And so, I mean, I respect this, but I know that it's not me. So then I tried in my personal project to do some short films and stuff. And this is this is good. Sometimes I see short films. I really love the idea of the short film, mm -hmm. maybe something uh, abstract, you know, with music. This is what, for example, it's something that I'm interested in. And I tried to combine, uh, and I did it in the past, some uh, experiments, you know, with visuals and music because of my passions. But it's a short film. It's something that uh, no matter what will take uh, a certain amount of time in your life. And that's it. I think I have a lot of respect for uh, directors. I, I, I love filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but, um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to answer this question mm -hmm. because I know, and I see a lot of people also coming from visual effects or concept that they want to become directors. But I believe most of the things that I see have to do more with cinematography, with the look of things. They yeah. do things that are abstract, but actually storytelling is different. I mean, a director, I mean, you can have like a stupid video camera and two actors. It's interaction between people, between the actors. This is what is the most important thing most of the time. Then you can do movies or short movies that are abstract and stuff like this. But I don't know, people in my industry, I think they're more into the look of things, the design, and you can see beautiful things mm -hmm. online. But telling a story is a little bit different. And someone who wants to be a director, I think, would start earlier, in my opinion, just with a few tools and maybe with the family, with the you know, brothers and sisters, yeah. and try to around the table and tell a story and create, try to create drama. You know what I mean? So yeah. this is my point of view. <laughs> All right. Um, do you have any advice for young talent? Well, I mean, uh, not it's, at it's, all, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's hopeless. Very, it's, <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. It's just different. It's not hopeless at all because at the end of the day, it depends. It's, I, I, I really like this because at the end of the day, we do something that it's still meritocratic. I mean, you have to show that you can do the work. Mm -hmm. And I always appreciated this. The fact of having a showreel, a portfolio. I don't have to show you my resume with written words saying, okay, I, I studied this, I did this. Mm -hmm. Please give me a chance to 
show you that I can do the work. I can show what I can do. I can show my experience. So, you know what I mean? And I, and I, and I think this is important because uh, even nowadays, if you really want to become a, a storyteller, no matter the role, you, you can still do it. It's just the ways are different. For example, social media are important. Uh, what I would say is that uh, definitely you should uh, try to understand what you want to do. Because generally when you start in visual effects or no matter what, in the entertainment industry, you want to do so much, mm -hmm. everything maybe, mm -hmm. but there are different roles and the industry often requires specialists. So it's good, like I was saying before, probably it's good to have a knowledge, a generalist knowledge, so that you understand how the everything works in filmmaking. But at the same time, uh, I think uh, the best advice would be to try to, f to be honest with yourself and to really be honest with the, and find what you really like to do. Because if you're an animator and you like to give life to characters, you're not a programmer, I suppose, you know what I mean? So th there is something that if you do effects, uh, then my painting is completely different, you know what I mean? So uh, the people who come to me often, they're a little bit confused and even more nowadays, they're confused because they see everything amazing on social media and they don't realize that it would take a long time. But if they're willing to put the time, I think that anyone can still uh, work in this industry unless AI destroys us all, I don't know, but... Uh, <laughs> I think I think it, it's possible and it's great. I mean, it's tough. They probably a lot of people don't realize that it's freaking hard work, yeah. but I wouldn't change anything. The fact of, uh, like I was saying before, uh, waking up in the morning and being able to to push myself to even even when I do when I work for clients to try to do something nice or if I have a chance to learn something new, it's mm -hmm. awesome. And not everyone can can say this with their job. Not everyone is happy uh, doing what they do. You know what I mean? So this is a really great. This is success already. Yeah. But it, it also needs to be, as you mentioned before, you need to be really honest about yourself, what is it, what it is. And that, that's also a process that can take years Absolutely. to find out what it is that you really want. And also it's, it is a moving target, so it can also change over time. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very true. Honest with yourself. And yes, it can change over time. Like it happened to me, even if the world was the same with storytelling, but yes, it can change. You have to listen to yourself mm -hmm. and also to be honest mm -hmm. and not blame uh, external things for your failures. And that's why I love, sorry if I, if I say this, but um, I love about art because it's very honest. There is no shortcut. You know what I mean? Instead, writing a prompt for me, it is a shortcut, but actually yeah. it's not. And, and you have to put your, your effort into this and... Uh, it's honorable. I love this about art. Yeah. It's it's honest. You yeah. know what I mean? And yeah. no, I, I don't need to uh, have this name or know someone. Of course, it's very important and you know to know people to be in the right place. But you know what I mean? If you're not able to do your job and it takes time, it takes time, sorry, to be able to do your job. I mean, uh, ciao, ciao. You, 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 you can't <laughs> work in this industry. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's yeah. honest. Yeah. And I love this about art. Yeah. This is a great statement about that. It, it is actually honest and I completely agree. You mentioned earlier on like work-life balance and I personally still struggle a lot with that also. Kind of, it is hard to achieve. Um, did you reach it and do you have some tips to get better at it? Well, I think like, I mean, like you were saying, it's a... Uh daily job, I think. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I can say that when uh, my son was born, it was uh, really important because I changed the way of dealing with time. I became much more organized. Mm -hmm. And because of who I am, probably I didn't work in this industry. And right now I'm not trying to have success to fill some gaps, internal gaps, something, for example, like lack of love. And so you need to have millions of followers or you need mm -hmm. to always be told, uh, wow, you're so good. I do it for the true passion of it. And so I've been able to be honest with you to, to find a balance, even if like we were saying before, uh, every day, because there is something new to learn. So, but it's, it's important for me to have clear your uh, priorities. For me, my priority and something that for me is more important than what I do is to raise my child properly because yeah. it's yeah. definitely far more important. And so I know people who made incredible sacrifices with their families 
and maybe they didn't see their uh, children grow up in the first years, which are the most important, by the way, is just to work on certain movies. I personally believe that this is uh, not very smart. And, uh, and maybe it shows that you do certain things, you know, to fill a void to, for other reasons. Mm-hmm. And uh, so for me, it's about being uh, being honest. I know that my family is important and I need to be able to to be good, to be successful at this, at least try yeah. to be able then to be successful in my work life. You know what I mean? In what I do mm-hmm. and in my creative endeavors and my failures, I need to be able to to know that I, I at least I'm trying to do a good job because I think, uh, and actually this is something that you understand probably when you, at least I did when I became a father, how important it is for uh, a child to have uh, the family, you know, need to grow up in a certain way. Yeah. And I think that my biggest success would be to to teach and to, to put on earth someone uh, with values, someone, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, a good human being. I think this is more important than a lot of other things. And I remember, I have to quote this artist, but it's funny how certain things stick to your brain. Uh, It's probably 20, 25 years ago, I read an article from this artist from New York called uh, CG artist, Chris Revell, who I don't know, I mean, I never met, but I remember, and it's good that I mentioned him. I don't know where he is now, but he was writing in this article that at the end of the day, people will not remember you because you work on this movie or that movie or because yeah. you designed this ship. They will remember you as a good husband, father, brother, sister. And this stuck with me. And I think it's very true. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I tried to do this to, uh, to find the balance by knowing what my priority is. And then dedicating time as much as possible to my passion. And I think it's also good for my son to be able to see that he can achieve his goals and that he can uh, he can achieve anything he wants if he puts the time, the effort, the passion. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. this is already is a good teaching. Mm-hmm. All right. Two final questions to slowly, slowly wrap this up. Uh, I think this this could go on and on, right? Um, yeah. If you would recommend one book everybody should read, which one would it be and, and why? Oh, well, I mean, I read, uh, I really love reading and I read a lot, a lot of books because uh, something that we didn't talk about is the fact that, well, definitely it came through, but you need to have a sort of kind of personality Mm -hmm. to be able also to work in this industry, to survive because of the failures, because of the no, no's, because of the um, criticism. So you need to develop a certain kind of mindset. You have to become strong, you know, in a a way, Uh, above all, when you're a freelancer, you know what I mean? Also because there are so many people so good, you know what I mean? So you have to to find your balance. And definitely books helped me a lot in this. And I was very interested. So I read a lot of books about psychology, learning. So there are a lot and I could give you titles, but uh, definitely books that come to my mind is uh, Mastery. There are a lot of people, I mean, it's very famous. There are two books called Mastery by two different authors, but they're very good. And so uh, um, one is uh, Robert Greene, I remember, and uh, I advise anyone to read this book. It's a big book, but there's also, I I saw recently in the store, short version, and even on YouTube, you can find uh, people talking about this this book. Then I remember uh, reading, uh, I mean, there are so many books. Uh, (laughs) The Art of Learning is written by a guy, I don't remember the name, but he was uh, an incredible um, chess player as Mm -hmm. as young talent who then decided to give up chess and uh, become, he became a martial artist, but of a extremely, I mean, he was very, very talented. And he talks, it's very famous. It's called The Art of Learning. I don't remember the name of the author, but it's fantastic because he talks about the art of learning. So how he he adapted his uh, way of learning to be able to achieve incredible results in life. You Mm -hmm. can find a lot of books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we were saying before, you don't need to read them all to understand. And often a lot of these books are uh, also marketing. You know what I mean? There is like, there is no three rules to become successful. This kind of things, no. But I really like the idea of reading these books and taking what is useful for me, which doesn't mean it doesn't have to be 100%. Yeah. 
because yeah. but something is still uh, to be in a way if you want uh, reading books of this kind is uh, like being surrounded by right uh, inspiration you know what i mean not everything that you read but it's good so but beside of this i can tell you that one book that i absolutely love but i mean it's not that i would advise anyone to read but it's something very dear to me is the short stories of Edgar Allan Poe because uh, they're amazing, uh, you know, um, it's the beginning of Gothic novels. And also because I have versions of these books with me, they're very small, they come from my mother, very small books, they can still smell, smell, you know, time mm -hmm. and age. Mm -hmm. And nowadays I, I read everything I said, all my books, I read it on the iPad, on the Kindle, yeah. stuff like this, yeah. but it's not the same. So I would say, I, I, I really love this, uh, these books by these short stories, which are masterpieces, but because also of the format, because also it's, it's a book. And nowadays we're not used to reading yeah. real books with real paper, plus the, the paper is yellow. It's, it's amazing. I love them. I always have them with me. This is a fascinating <laughs> aspect, like the, the physicality and the, the smell of the, um, of the pages, for example. Yeah, exactly. One of the last books which I read, I uh, was actually uh, the Shining by King, Stephen King, and uh, it's it's actually very interesting. Just uh, looking at the font, it's kind of you look at the page. You nowhere else you see this kind of type of font, but okay. it's so perfect as a book. I'm not sure why they are choosing these types of fonts for those books. Yeah. Probably they are extremely, uh, what's it called, legible kind of readable yeah yeah absolutely um, yeah yeah but that's fascinating and yeah there's there's definitely this physicality of a book also but it's funny that you mentioned stephen king because why you start talking i was thinking i forgot to mention <laughs> a book by stephen king uh, that is called on writing and it's about him talking about his process and i suggest mm. every creative mm -hmm. person to write this book it's beautiful and it's funny that you mentioned stephen king <laughs> it's called On Writing by Stephen King. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's fantastic. It's really good. No, even if you're not a writer, but if you're a creative person, it's. Uh, I found it very, very interesting. I've seen some interviews also where uh, on on YouTube or at least parts of them are, are online where there are dialogues between J.R.R. Martin yes, uh, and, I saw it. and King, just talking to each other about their, yeah, their yeah, writing yeah. process. It's fascinating to see. And by the way, I, I <laughs> totally admire no matter what the writers because they have, they come up with incredible stories and I don't have the skills at all. You know what I mean? So I always need to be influenced by something. Yeah. These yeah. people, they come up, they really come up with words yeah. and, yeah, and it's, literally. it's fantastic and a uh, head off to them. That's yeah. why I also like writing and I admire their work, for example, Ken Follett. I love a lot of, uh, I read a lot of uh, novels by Ken Follett, which are historical, but there is a part of, uh, uh, there is a uh, fiction, but there's so much, you know, knowledge and research in the historical part. It's fantastic. I really, I mean, writers are, wow, what a job. <laughs> Sweet. Last question, at least from my end. <laughs> if you could change one thing on the planet, what would it be? or to basically to make the planet a better place? What would it be? Wow, what a question to, to end the conversation. <laughs> I could say something uh, very banal these days, mm. definitely. I mean, uh, to do something right now about global warming would be something uh, important mm. because uh, it seems like uh, from my perspective that politicians are not doing enough or anything. And I, I saw a lot of documentaries, very interesting about scientists who already found ways and, and technology, they're developing technologies to make this uh, happen, to, to, to solve the problem. And it's very interesting. So on the other hand, I don't see so much from the politician. And the sad thing is that right now, crazy things are happening already and the people who are suffering are the poor people, you know, yeah. far away from us. So I don't know what they're waiting. But this, of course, it's, uh, I mean, uh, common, hopefully, answer. Uh, if I can think about something else, I would say the, the way of, um, of uh, organizing schools and educations. I would love mm -hmm. to have schools who are more interested in uh, trying to develop a program who could take uh, really the best out of every kid, meaning to find ways to make them find their own passion and to give them tools 
to learn how to learn, because this is what I think is very important of schools. So to learn the system, to learn how to learn, because eventually they will have to do it. They will have to do it. So instead of maybe notions that you have to learn by heart, certain things are very important, uh, history and stuff like this, obviously to have good basis, mm -hmm. but it could also probably, I mean, I say it in a naive way because I don't know exactly and I wouldn't know how to do it, but it would be nice to not, uh, you know, uh, kill maybe passions of kids who just want uh, an, an opportunity because sometimes at, at home, uh, uh, the kids don't have the chance to, you know, to spread their, their wings and, and teachers yeah. are very important for this because I remember some of my teachers and the, the teachers I remember are the teachers who taught me, who showed me the passion for what they were teaching. Yeah. I remember this. Yeah. Yeah. So this is something that I'm thinking about. That's very noble. I like it. Any any last thoughts or comments from your end? No, I, I thank you for this opportunity, and I hope it would be interesting for uh, people listening. It's we we will see it. We will see about that. But it was very very interesting uh, to me. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, whichever the, the platform is where this uh, podcast will basically be played. Uh, we will try to add some social media links or website links and so on in the okay. quote-unquote description if uh, so for people that want to reach out to you or have questions and so on and uh, yeah I think that's that's been it for this very first podcast it's been an honor to have you here Marco ah, for me thank you and thank you so much I would say let's wrap this baby up and go enjoy a very nice evening Cool. Thank you and you too. Thanks, man. Cool. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.